Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure today to introduce Terry Lingso, our own Master Gardener presenter. Terry is president of Lingso Garden Materials. She is a master gardener, a master composter, and a lover of the natural world. Soil, plants, and climate change. What a timely presentation now. Terry will answer questions at the end of her presentation uh, during the Q&A session. So we're trying out a new thing here. <laughs> so click the reaction button at the bottom right-hand Zoom screen. Click raise hand, then lower hand. Your name will be put in the queue managed by our host. Um, you will be able to ask the questions at the end of Terry's presentation. So without further ado, let's welcome Terry Lingso. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for inviting Nancy and me to speak on soil, plants, and climate change. Uh, we put the talk together for a local Sierra Club meetup, and sadly, Nancy has another, uh, had another event that she needed to attend and uh, was not going to be able to present with me. That event fell through and she is here, but she isn't presenting, but I miss her. I wish she was here giving the talk with me. We had a really fun time doing it. Um, neither Nancy nor I are experts on climate change, but our study of the soil has led us to see the connection between healthy soil, the hydrologic cycle, which is how water cycles in all its forms and the carbon cycle. It's not just, climate ch change is not just about greenhouse gas emissions. It's more complicated than that. Most of us are aware of climate change and the need for taking CO2, one of the greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere as a way to cool the planet. But did you know that water vapor is the most abundant greenhouse gas and the hydrological cycle on earth has been impacted by our practices? It's important to understand all this on a global scale so we can make good choices at the grocery store and in the way we obtain and use energy. And we can also make a difference every day by the way we garden. I will go over how carbon and water cycle naturally and how gardening with nature in mind will help these processes. You can truly make a difference to the climate in your garden and in the process, make friends with a much bigger community. So here's the outline for today's talk. I'll start with a very brief overview of Earth's time scale, which is incredibly complicated, and I'm going to be, it's going to be very brief. Then a review of photosynthesis and biological carbon sequestration. Then talk uh, briefly about where we find carbon on Earth and go through the carbon cycle. We'll do a, I'll do a quick review of soil because it's really important and then take a look at the importance of living soil. Next, show you what you can do right now in your garden to store carbon and help water infiltrate and percolate through your soil and in turn cool our planet. The end will appropriately be with a bit of California native plants and the larger community and summarize with the thought that soil protection is climate protection. There will be time for questions, and remember this is a complex topic. I have listed a number of resources at the end of the presentation, uh, which I hope uh, you might find interesting. So, life on Earth has been evolving for a very long time. 500 million years ago, um, plants moved onto land, and the crust of the Earth was changed. The bacteria, fungi, and plants transform the rocks that make up the earth into carbon-rich soils. This allowed water to infiltrate and be stored in the soil and aquifers and move into creeks, rivers, and lakes and out to our bays and oceans. An atmosphere just right for life was built with just the right amount of carbon and water to keep us warm. Plants in the microbial community influence our local weather. Plants cover and shade the soil 
So the soil stays cool and moisture stays in the soil. And the microbial community builds soil structure so the soil can hold on to water. Because the soil retains moisture, plants are able to use that water and release water and they release water vapor through their stomata to cool down, which in turn cools the surrounding area. Over 90% of the water plants take up is released as vapor to the atmosphere. Water evaporating from land and plant transpiration form clouds and fall in the form of precipitation, rain, over the local area. In the rainforest, 50 to 80% of the water remains local through this cycle. This small water cycle is critical for local weather and plants drive the system and soil rich in organic matter ensures water infiltrates into the soil, is held in the soil and is available to plants. The more we deforest, pave over the soil, degrade the soil, the less water is able to infiltrate into the soil, making it difficult for plants to thrive, which impacts the small water cycle. There's also a large water cycle, which brings atmospheric rivers to the west coast of North America. Atmospheric rivers are concentrated streams of moist air, generally more than 1200 miles long, up to 620 miles wide and about 1.8 miles deep. They form in the warm waters of the Pacific Ocean. Atmospheric rivers are important for our water supply as they are major contributors to the snowpack in the Sierras. Last winter, we witnessed the devastation of an atmospheric river when 16 inches of rain caused a debris flow, which took out a large section of Highway 1 near Big Sur. As our climate warms, we are seeing more intense rain events. As the Pacific Ocean warms, we are seeing less fog in California. Fog provides much needed moisture during our long dry season and our coastal redwood forests are dependent upon fog during our long dry season. Soil carbon stocks or organic matter in soil are important for the carbon cycle and the water cycle. The organic matter in soils is highly vulnerable to human activities such as deforestation, tillage, and unsustainable agricultural practices. Deforestation alone contributes about 10% of all human-induced greenhouse gas emissions. The drainage of marshlands and turning meadows, prairies, and grasslands into agricultural land is particularly problematic as they represent the most efficient carbon store of all terrestrial ecosystems. Forests contribute, forests contribute to, the in, to the intensification of rainfall through, interestingly enough, biological particles that are um, that sit on their on their uh, on their leaves and um, are released with wind. These fungal spores, pollen, bacterial cells, biological debris, and bacteria all help moisture to condense around these particles. When these particles get, uh, contain enough moisture, then rain falls to the ground. Interestingly, Pseudomonas syringia, a bacteria that is found in the air and land, is able to freeze cloud droplets at a much higher temperature than we normally find in the atmosphere. Pseudomonas syringia plays a crucial role in the formation of all forms of precipitation, raindrops, hail, and snow. So climate is complex. There are many systems on earth that impact the climate and therefore our local weather. 26% of the greenhouse effect on earth comes from CO2. There's about 60% of the greenhouse effect on earth comes from water vapor and clouds. 
Water vapor is very complex, and I think we're still really trying to understand what it means. But there is much we can do in our own gardens and the choices we make daily that can make a positive difference. So let's take a quick review of photosynthesis. So soil is a complex living system. Soil life needs plants and plants need soil life. As master gardeners, we but know about photosynthesis. Plants use energy from sunlight, take in carbon dioxide and water and break the bond between the carbon and the oxygen. Some of the carbon carbohydrate is used by the plant to build their bodies and grow. Some is used by the plant to feed their preferred microbial community. The oxygen is released to the atmosphere. A healthy soil is full of life. The bacteria, bacteria and fungal community are the main decomposers and many are aerobic. They are constantly breaking down everything that falls to the ground or dies underground. As they do this, they respire. So some carbon dioxide is cycled back to the atmosphere for use by plants. Some of the carbon through the decomposition process is reduced to a very stable form called humus. Humus has the ability to hold on to water like a sponge and to hold on to many nutrients. This is key to carbon storage in the soil. We need plants and the microbial community to create soil structure and organic matter in the soil. So carbon, humus, and water can be stored in the soil. So let's take a look at the carbon pools on earth to understand how we got out of balance. So understanding soil carbon is key to understanding why plants and living soil are so important to the climate and the environment. Carbon is not being created or destroyed, but is moving between the pools. Some, uh, some pools are, sit, are really safe to store carbon in, while others, the atmosphere and the ocean are really exceeding capacity. Over the last 40 years, carbon emissions from fossil fuel use and tropical deforestation have added 160 parts per million of CO2 to the Earth's atmosphere. About 40 parts per million of that has diffused possibly into our oceans. Another 50 parts per million have been actively taken up by plants but 70 parts per million remain in the atmosphere and together with other greenhouse gases is responsible for the land warming patterns that have, we have been observing since the 80s. Our oceans are becoming more acidic due to the increase in CO2. For eons, the world's oceans have removed carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and released it again in a steady inhale and exhale. The oceans take up carbon dioxide through photosynthesis by plants like phytoplankton, as well as by simple chemistry. Carbon dioxide dissolves in water and in the alkaline waters of the ocean forms bicarbonate, a form of carbon that doesn't escape the ocean easily. As the oceans warm, they are less able to take in the carbon dioxide so the atmosphere will retain the car carbon dioxide, which means more heat. This is where plants and soil microbial community can help. So let's focus on biota, life, the carbon that is held in living organisms. All living organisms from trees to humans are made primarily of carbon. When living organisms die, they are decomposed by a diverse community, which forms the organic matter component in soil. Soil is the largest terrestrial carbon sink, and most importantly, it is safe and beneficial to put carbon there, unlike the oceans or the atmosphere. 
Carbon can flow between biota, biota, life, and soil through the digestive processes of the soil microbial community. The more carbon organic matter in the soil, the better the soil can hold on to water and nutrients, and therefore the plants growing in the soil are healthier. So what is soil? Well, soil is made up of the, lith the lithosphere, the parent rock material, the sand, the silt, the clay. This is the mineral component. The atmosphere is also very important in soil. Soil is constantly exchanging gases. The atmosphere is 78% nitrogen. Isn't that interesting? Why do we need to add nitrogen fertilizers? The soil contains 21% oxygen and about 0.04% carbon dioxide. And then of course there's some other greenhouse gases. The hydrosphere is water in all its forms, liquid, vapor, and solid. The biosphere in the center brings it all together. Without life, the atmosphere, the lithosphere, and the hydrosphere would be very different. Without life, there would be no soil as we know it. Note that soil life also cycles nitrogen, which makes nitrogen available to plant. That process can occur in a healthy soil with a diverse soil biology. Soil that is biologically active is soil that has good gas exchange, allows water to infiltrate in, be held in pores and spaces, and percolate deep into the soil. The minerals in the soil usually contain just about everything a plant needs to grow. The fungi and the bacteria are able to make these important nutrients available to plant. So now let's take a look at what a healthy soil looks like. Okay, this is the soil matrix. I want you to take a look at it and notice that 50% of this matrix is essentially open space for air and water. Isn't that amazing? I don't think we really appreciate how much space there is in healthy soil. So this empty space is critical and it's built by the microbial community and it's filled with water or gas or a combination of the two. We need good gas exchange in the soil because the organisms are all, the organisms all respire like we do. And the atmosphere is diffusing into the soil as well. We also need water in the soil. Plants need moisture, microorganisms need moisture. Water is key for organisms and plants to function healthily. It almost about 45 to 50% of the soil is the mineral component, the sand, the silt, the clay. And then a very small amount, 5%, maybe 10% is the organic matter. And this is in, incredibly important. Without that organic matter and those organisms, you would not have that 50% space. It's their work that built that space and is creating the soil that can support a healthy plant. An increase of 1% of, of carbon or humus in the soil will increase the water holding capacity by 2000 gallons per acre. So this 0.5% of this matrix is the soil life. And they are the reason that plants can thrive and we in turn thrive. 
Uh, next, next, let's look at the mineral portion of the soil, the parent rock material. So you've all seen the soil texture triangle. And it's, it's, it really is important to know the texture of your soil because it will give you a better understanding of if your soil drains well, sandy soil, if it holds onto water really tightly, clay soil. So the texture is really important for the ability of air and water to move through the soil. And this is where the soil organisms uh, play a key part in building structure in this mineral component. In clay soil, the particles are very, very small and very small particles have a very large surface area. So amazingly, they are able to, clay particles are able to hold on to a lot more water than a, than a sandy soil. But because the clay is so small, and sometimes the clay stacks like plates, they hold on to the water very, very tightly, and it's very difficult for plant roots to get at that water. And they are also very easy to compact. So think of, uh, think of a clay lining in a pond. No water is moving through that clay lining. When you compact, Place clay soil, it can become an impervious surface. Next, uh, let's take a look at how the microbial community turns sand, silt, and clay into living soil. Oh, but before I go there, let me just mention that for a lot of us living here, a lot of us have uh, a sandy loam clay, a uh, sandy loam soil. I see that a lot in, in tests. But uh, sometimes we might think we have a lot of clay in our soil because water does not move through it. But really that is more an indication of compaction than it really is the percentage of clay in your soil. And there are some places uh, in, in San Mateo County for sure where there is very heavy clay soil. So now let's take a look at how the microbial community turns sand silt clay into living soil. So remember the soil matrix and that 50% space for air and water. Well, this is how that happens. Look at that, look at that um, little soil aggregate there. The microbial life, the bacteria and fungi are busy breaking everything that falls to the ground or that dies down. They're busy decomposing everything. Plant roots are releasing exudates into the soil, feeding uh, specific microbes exactly what those microbes want. So calling in the microbes that they want to live in their root zone or the rhizosphere. The bacteria and the fungi uh, make glues and they're able to glue the mineral component and the organic matter in the soil together. As they do this, they create aggregates and this becomes their home. You can see if you look at the, uh, at the little um, figure there, you can see uh, little spaces, pore spaces, and you can see um, colonies of bacteria, and the various different microbes that live within that soil. So when you have these spaces, and even though these spaces can be very small, you have good gas exchange and you have good water infiltration, and you have the ability to hold water within the pore space. So that it's available to the plants later on in the, out of the rainy season. So it's this microbial community that forms these aggregates and it's and creates this home. And it's our responsibility not to squish them and not to squish uh, all the air and the water out of these aggregates. This is key. On the next slide, 
um, the next two slides, we'll look at how water and air are affect how water and air flow are affected by good soil structure compared to a compacted soil. So this slide really helps you see where pore space is and isn't. On the left, this side shows lots of pore space. And uh, notice the little box at the top. There's about an equal amount of air and water within this, within this, uh, within this space here. Some water clings to the particles and is available uh, and stays there and is available to the plant with the help of their mycorrhizal fungi partners who have very thin uh, hyphae and are able to reach into this tightly held water around uh, clay minerals and maybe in organic matter. And they're able to pull that out and give it to the plant during the dry season. This is very, very important relationship. In a soil with lots of pore space, some water pools and may be available directly to the plant roots. Water is also able to infiltrate, move through the soil horizons and to recharge our aquifer. In this example, we see how water can become a reservoir, how soil can become a reservoir for water when we have good biological structure. In contrast, the diagram on the right shows what happens to air and water when the soil is compacted. Notice the little box at the top, lots of water, not very much air. So while water uh, may move in to a certain degree, it will be held tightly. In a compacted soil, the water is going to have a hard time fill in and uh, infiltrating deeper into the soil. It's going to be held in that top layer. There's going to be very little air there. So the microbial community is not going to be really happy without uh, good gas exchange. And, um, and the plant roots are not going to be, most plant roots are not going to be happy in living in primarily a water environment. So this soil uh, will become saturated pretty quickly. And then the water will run off carrying the topsoil along with it and uh, creating some erosion. So let's take a look at pore space from uh, another angle. So here you could think of as uh, same two soils, same two types of soil, same mineral component in these soils. Let's pretend that each of these uh, circles here contain exactly one cubic foot. Now, when you take a look at this, um, you'll see that 50% of the soil on the right is airspace and uh, space for water. And about 45% is mineral and then 5% is organic matter, just like the, the uh, soil matrix we saw. Now take a look on the compacted soil. There's far more soil in this one cubic foot. There's far more mineral component in this one cubic foot of soil. And what's going to happen when you start developing soil structure in here, start growing the life in your soil, start increasing the organic matter, get some plant roots in there, um, you're going to start uh, increasing that uh, space for air and water. And you're gonna find that your soil, hey, it's growing, but it isn't the mineral component that's growing. It's the empty space that's growing. It's the space for water and air to infiltrate that's growing. It's the homes of the, um, the microbial community that is causing that soil to grow. So over time, that soil, um, will have 50% uh, space and it will be more than one cubic foot of soil because of that space. 
So I think, I hope that you can see how important living soil is for a cooler climate. By cycling and storing carbon, organic matter in the soil, uh, this is allowing the microbial community to thrive. They're part of that organic material. They're building that organic matter. They're increasing the organic matter in your soil. That organic matter in your soil, a lot of which is carbon. So you're storing carbon in the soil, you're cycling carbon in the soil, you're creating airspace and space for water, you're creating passages so that um, when we do have a rain event, that water is able to move into that soil it's able to be held in that soil and it's able to move farther down. And you're taking your, 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 you're keeping your water in your soil and you're keeping some carbon in your soil. And by that, you're cooling the climate. So let's review carbon's influence on soil structure and water infiltration and percolation. So more water is held in the soil than in all freshwater lakes, ponds, rivers, streams, and creeks. So how water moves through soil is extremely important. When we don't have biological life and living plants, the sun dries out the soil, the wind blows the finer particles away, think of dust storms, and the sand silt clay runoff with the rain causing erosion. Soil aggregates and therefore soil structure, as I keep saying, is created by the carbon glues that come from the, from the uh, bacteria and fungi. The fungi are very important. The saprophytic fungi are the decomposers. The mycorrhizal fungi are the plant partners. When, moder when water moves through well-structured soil, it is stored in the pore space and around organic matter and around the mineral components, the sand, silt, clay. In a living soil, excess water can perk deeper into the soil and recharge our aquifers. When aquifers are recharged, wells remain active and there is no subsidence or lowering of the land due to depleted aquifers like we're seeing in the Central Valley of California right now. In well-structured soil, water moves through the ground rather than over the top of the soil, which prevents loss of sediment and erosion, and our creeks, streams, and rivers run clear. And as an additional note, the microbial life, which is made of carbon, sees everything as food and can break down many toxins into non-toxic elements. So how do you know if you have structure in your soil? Well, here's a fun little test that you can do uh, with some of your garden soil. It's called the Soil Aggregate Stability Test. And what you do is you grab a, get a clump of soil from your garden, let it dry out for a week, then fill um, a quart jar with water, maybe about two thirds of the way full, and gently submerge your little clump of soil in the water and watch. Does it stay together as the cylinder on the left? Excuse me, I get confused with, yes, yeah, the cylinder on the left, or does it fall apart as the cylinder on the right? And what does this tell you? What do you think this is telling you? If your clump of soil stays together, that's telling you your soil is glued together by the microbial community. You have stable aggregates in your soil. When you have a rain event, that rain is going to be able to move into your soil, be held in your soil, and move farther down into your soil. And that soil is storing a lot of carbon. If you don't have uh, a lot of life in your soil, when you put that clump of soil into water, it will melt like ice cream. I can almost guarantee that every single one of you will find that your soil will pass 
the aggregate stability test. Okay, so now we're gonna take a look at two soils right next to each other and listen to their story. Okay, so soil compaction, degradation versus biological soil structure. So as you can see the soil in the bottom uh, on, on the uh, left side of the image has been clear cut. It looks like it's been burned. The soil on the right is an intact rainforest. So when, when the soil on the left, the soil that has been um, degraded is going to be losing its organic matter. It's gonna be hot. The sun's gonna beat down on that soil and it's gonna be hot and the air around it is gonna be hot. When there's a rain event, the clays and the silts in that soil may move down with water, but they probably will create a compaction layer down in the soil. Eventually rainwater will run off along with the soil, taking the sand, silt, clays along with it and little water will be held within the soil. There's gonna be very poor gas exchange as this soil compacts and few plants will grow. On the right, where we see a nice rainforest, the soil organic matter is going to be increasing and carbon is going to be stored. The soil is going to be cool because it's shaded by all the plants and the air in turn is going to be cooler. Rainwater will be able to infiltrate into that soil and be held in that soil and move farther down to recharge the aquifers. There's not gonna be runoff in this of water in this soil. And the topsoil is going to stay glued in place. There's good gas exchange and there's a, and there's a diversity of healthy plants and microbial community. This is an intact system. But there are, there are additional ways besides this very severe example in which we can damage our soil structure. One is by tilling. Just tilling breaks up the soil aggregates, reduces the fungal populations, especially the mycorrhizal fungi. It increases oxygen in the soil, which seems like a good thing, but that encourages aerobic bacteria to turn on and decompose the organic matter. So you're actually reducing organic matter in your soil when you till your soil. Over time, you are left more with sand and silt and clay, um, less organic matter. Think of areas of the world that were once lush and vegetative and are now sand dunes. Overuse of biocides, pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, are general, they are generally not specific. They are, they kill everything. They kill a wide range of life far beyond their intended culprit. First step for us is to understand the problem. What is the problem? What is, what is the weed? What is the pest? What is the disease? And then see if you can discover other ways in which to deal with it rather than reaching for a biocide. If you do feel you must use a product, do understand how it may impact other life forms. Fertilizers also surprisingly can be very hard on the soil. Some fertilizers feed the soil, feed the plant directly. Some fertilizers feed the life in the soil. Be aware of what you are doing, of what you are using and who you are feeding. If you feed the plant, if you continuously feed the plant directly, the plant really doesn't have any reason to support its diverse microbial community. And that actually makes for a less healthy plant. When a plant is fed directly from the microbial community, they are healthier and more disease and pest resistant. So, what can we do in our gardens? 
Well, first off, I hope you see that it isn't just about CO2 in the atmosphere. And remember, we, we're we very thankful that we have an atmosphere because that's what keeps our climate um, uh, comfortable here for life. But as we release greenhouse gases and a lot of water vapor into the atmosphere, we do have the heat from the sun is maintained within the atmosphere and it gets hotter. So the earth needs living soil to manage the hydrologic cycle, the water cycle and the carbon cycle. This is why soil structure built by the microbial community with the plants participation is so important. It is plants and their microbial community that balance these two very important cycles. It takes a community to cool the environment, to cool the planet, meaning all of us. So what can we do in our gardens to build a soil that stores and cycles carbon and is a reservoir for water? Well, you know, I really like to observe and I really, I really imagine as master gardeners, you all are good observers. But going out in your garden during different times of the year is a really great thing to do. This happens to be images we took in our garden um, around our where we live uh, this winter. So uh, this was after a little bit of rain and boy, we sure only got a little bit of rain uh, this winter. So in a rain year like this last year, Having good soil structure is super important. You want every single raindrop to go into the ground and be held in that soil. It's very, very important. You do not want it to run off. You'll notice uh, the little mushrooms in the top uh, left-hand corner. Those are saprophytic mushrooms. They are important decomposers and they're breaking down organic matter in the soil. I could not see what they were breaking down but I can see them, excuse the dog, um, probably some dead roots. And then after a little rain, they send up a mushroom, which will release spores and spread the fungi. The next uh, image over is um, little turkey tail or polypores that are slowly and beautifully turning a dead oak limb into humus. The next is a handful of soil after a winter rain. It shows the aggregate in the soil, all the work done by the microbial community. And you can see the, the pore spaces. You can see the opening. You can see that this, this uh, handful of soil is underneath mulch. So the mulch is breaking the fall of the rain. Then the rain is gently moving in through all these pores being held and moving farther down. Below that beautiful clump of soil is some nice compacted soil that has a little bit of uh, moss growing on it. But notice life is ever active. Notice those holes in that compacted soil. Well, someone's doing some work there. Someone's opening that soil up. This soil is going to transform over time. And I think one of the reasons this soil is so compacted is it didn't have any mulch on it. The next uh, image over is a little uh, weedy. This is a weed from the garden. And this is the root zone of the weed. And this is just to give you an idea that even weeds um, have relationships with the microbial community. And weeds are doing a fantastic job of actually um, building soil structure and helping rainwater to move into the soil. Um, then the next image over, the last one is wormholes. I always love seeing wormholes. This happens to be on a pathway that's very compacted. And in the winter, every winter, uh, the worms open that up. They put their castings out. Um, they allow, uh, um, air to move in there. Good gas exchange is happening and they're creating little passageways through the soil, which is creating channels for air and, uh, and for moisture. 
So you can see all of this and more as you walk through your garden. So take a walk during all the seasons of the year and see what your soil has to tell you. It's constantly telling you a story. So what do we do in our garden? Well, we let the microbes build the soil structure and our job is to understand the best way to protect that soil structure. So what we wanna do is we really want to prevent compaction in our garden. Mm -hmm. And in the top right-hand corner, of course, this is in a state of nature underneath a canyon oak tree, pull the leaves aside, the natural mulch from the oak tree, pull the leaves aside, See the little white uh, saprophytic fungi in there, decomposing all that, everything that has fallen to the ground and turning it into humus. This is one way to protect your soil. Underneath your oak trees, if you can, just let those oak leaves fall to the ground. And nature, the microbial community and the roots of plants will take care of it. They will build that soil structure for you. You don't have to do that much. Um, below is uh, our garden, um, and we just have it covered with plants. It is, our garden is pretty full with plants, and uh, we keep our pathways mulched, and, um, and that does a good job of protecting the soil from the sun, the wind, the rain, and that plant life is uh, introducing exudates into the soil, and those soil microbes are busy building soil structure, so when we have a big rain event, we don't have any water running off of our garden. It's all perking right down into the soil and it's recharging the underground aquifers, I certainly hope, because we are on well water. So we are super, super sensitive to the importance of ensuring that rainwater moves in and refills our aquifers. Uh, I wanted to talk about sheet mulching. Sheet mulching is uh, getting a really bad rap right now and for good reason. Um, sheet mulching, some people think that sheet mulching is just grabbing cardboard, putting it on top of the ground and putting a bunch of mulch on top. And that really is not an effective way to sheet mulch. Sheet mulching that way actually usually prevents rainwater from uh, moving into the soil because, you know, cardboard, uh, the cardboard, uh, if you're not, uh, if you don't have anyone, if you don't have the card, if the cardboard doesn't have good, good contact with the soil, um, it's just going to sit there. There's going to be air pockets. You're going to put mulch on top. The rain's going to come. That cardboard's going to be sitting on top of the soil. It's not going to decompose. And you're going to be surprised. You're going to come out uh, next spring and you're going to go, what happened? My cardboard's still here. Well, that's because the decomposition process could not happen. You have to have contact with the soil to get that decomposition process going. So I really prefer this method of sheet mulching. Um, if you've got annual weeds, go ahead and leave them there, chop them down, leave them on the ground, wet the soil put down a little bit of compost, maybe a quarter or three eighths of an inch or so, wet that down, wet down your cardboard, put it down on top of the compost, make sure you've got good con contact, put another layer of compost on top, moisten that, then put three inches or more of mulch on top of that, moisten that. Best time to do this is in the fall, um, because then you've got the winter rains coming in. And when you do this and come back in the springtime, your cardboard should be completely decomposed. You should be able to stick your fingers into your soil. You should see that aggregates are starting to develop. And this is the correct way to sheet mulch. Now keep in mind, sheet mulching is great for annual weeds. It's not so good for perennials. It is not gonna stop Bermuda grass as we know from the GEC. It is not going to stop bindweed. It is not going to stop ivy. It's not going to stop perennial plants, but it's great 
uh, in woody areas. And it's great in areas where the soil is compacted and you don't have anything growing. And cover crops. Cover crops are an excellent way to build uh, soil structure and you're, um, you're partnering uh, with the plant in the microbial community. Uh, we have attached in the resource section a handout for cover crops to use in California that are cool season and warm season cover crops. It has been, um, it is now uh, believed that a diverse multi-species cover crop is much more beneficial than just one or two cover crops, one or two different uh, cover plants. Um, a multi-species is much better uh, and will uh, provide more, um, will have more benefit for the soil. And remember, weeds are not bad. Weeds are healers. They come in in a progression. Usually weeds with deep tap roots come in first to open up the soil and help water move into the soil. Then the grasses come in and put a big mass of roots deep into the soil, providing a lot of carbon for the microbes to break down. You will oftentimes uh, find earthworms feeding around the roots, making channels into the soil for air and water. All weeds leave a lot of organic matter in the soil and on top of the soil, which is food for the microbial community and increases the organic matter content of the soil. Dead weeds mulch the soil, protecting the soil from the sun, wind, and rain. So uh, let's just look at a little, uh, a local um, close to home, UC Berkeley, Dr. Wendy Silver, professor of uh, ecosystem ecology and biogeochemistry in the Department of Environmental Science, Policy and Management um, at UC Berkeley is working on climate change and human impacts on the environment and the potential for mitigating these effects. The Silver Lab uh, is currently working on drought and hurricane impacts on tropical forests climate change mitigation potential of grasslands and greenhouse gas dynamics of peatlands and wetlands. Uh, Professor Silver is the lead uh, scientist for the Marin Carbon Project right here, just north of us, um, which is, uh, this project is determining the potential for land-based climate change mitigation particularly by composting high emission organic waste amendment to sequester uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide. You know, so they are using green waste, green waste, which we used to take to the landfill and, uh, and it would go anaerobic and uh, release methane. Now we're composting it. So what they've done uh, on, on this uh, rangeland is they brought in enough compost to cover a quarter inch of a specific area of rangeland. It was many, many acres. And they found that the water holding capacity just by doing that was increased by 17 to 25% after one application. Soil carbon increased by one ton per hectare or 2.47 acres and pasture production increased by 50 to 70%. So this is amazing uh, statistics of what can happen with just a little bit of compost and the microbial community that's living in that compost, what they have the capacity to do. It gives us a lot of hope, I think. So we're going to I'm going to close with a few words about the California native plant community and a final slide on soil protection is climate protection. So, you know, I hope you're seeing that um, that soil is part of the community. We live in this big, rich intricate, detailed, misunderstood community. And um, this big community supports 
all life on earth, the insects, the birds, the pollinators, the plants provide habitat, food, and shelter. And native plants can thrive in our climate. And they need, you know, little, they do need water. But where we live in Lomamar, uh, we don't have to do too much irrigating with the natives. And they are really, really um, important because they pull it all together. Native grasslands and meadows are excellent in building soil structure, putting a lot of carbon in the soil due to their massive number of roots. And one little, um, one little snippet of info from Jonathan uh, Lundgren, who's an entomologist. He said that the number of beneficials uh, per pest is 1,700 beneficials to one pest. So isn't that amazing? So, um, so anyway, I, I really am in favor of, of uh, supporting California natives and letting, helping them to support this larger community that we live in. And they know how to live in our climate if we have the soil life that they need, the mycorrhizal and the diversity of soil that they need to thrive because it is a community. So in closing, soil protection is climate protection. Sunlight powers the system. Microbes and plants maintain uh, the balance. Good soil structure allows for water infiltration, carbon sequestration, and healthy plants. We need to protect the soil from the elements with mulch or plant cover. And remember, uh, Nancy reminded me of this, that our native, uh, many of our native bees need unmulched soil. So leaving uh, some areas unmulched is uh, beneficial for them. We have to think of everyone. Let the microbial community and the plant com and the plants right. feed each other and observe and support uh, the community. It is an ecological system. So soil protection is climate protection and the earth is one big gigantic community. And in closing, I just want to say thank you so much to the soils committee that formed a few years ago to uh, Nancy Kruber, Kelly Torakai, uh, Joe Lees, uh, Jeff Clark, Laura Damsgard Hughes, um, Nick Landolfi for helping, um, helping us all to understand the soil better. So thank you very much. I really enjoyed giving this presentation to you and I hope it was helpful to you. Terry, thank you so much for that. Um, so such an enlightening presentation. Uh, I know that I have always uh, learned so much in uh, being part of Master Gardeners. And um, I hope all of us will take this information and apply it in our own gardens. And I've also noticed that in our edible series and uh, several other presentations, um, our Master Gardeners are beginning to include uh, information about soil and, and, and what we can do. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And um, now, um, oh, by the way, we're going to have um, 1.25 um, CE hours and you can, um, uh, you can log in under general meetings. So right now we're going to have a little uh, discussion and um, you can, we can show everybody now. <laughs> huh. And um, here's the Q and A. Great. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Terry. I think right now we only have one person with their hand raised. So Ginny, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yes, Terry, I have an area in my yard with a lot of pine trees. And um, in the rainy season, I do get a lot of mushrooms. So would it be a good idea to take those mushrooms and then move those over to an area in my yard that I that would benefit from having the fungi 
you know, to add to an area of my yard? I think that um, the fungi is there because there's a source of food there and um, they will migrate to other areas if there's a source of food there. So I, I'm not, I'm not sure that they would reestablish in another area of your garden. They're, they're probably, probably saprophytic fungi breaking down um, woody material in the store, in the soil. I know I have a, uh, I have a, a pine tree too, and I leave the needles on the ground and I have mushrooms coming up there oftentimes in, uh, in the winter. And I'm just assuming they're, they're busy breaking down. Uh, they're, they're eating, they're breaking things down in the soil. So um, no, you could, you could experiment and try it and see what happens, but they do need a source of food. So so maybe, maybe to, well, I was thinking taking a bunch of the pine needles, the food that they're eating, the pine needles, and you can you know, try it, it, try it, and see. You know, there's, there's, that's the fun of of working with the soil is you don't always know, and you just experiment and see what happens and watch. And um, I would say as long as it's not a really, you know, if it's a, if it's a little bit of a shady spot, it probably might be successful. I don't know, but let us know. It would be interesting experiment, experiment to try and see what happens. That's, okay. that's the beauty about this. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I think next is Cynthia with a question. Hi, Terry. I know that a lot of uh, everybody knows that I have part of my yard uh, as succulents, and I originally planted it uh, for drought tolerance. Um, I have read that you should not put a lot of mulch around your succulents because it encourages the water to, uh, you know, I haven't ever had a, a huge problem, but I don't have a lot of mulch on them. Do you recommend anything uh, mulching the ground for succulents? Yeah, that's interesting because it, uh, plants, you know, I, there's so much to talk about in, in this subject, but um, yeah, some plants do not prefer a woody mulch and uh, succulents would be one of, one of those that would not particularly prefer a woody mulch. So I think you're doing the right thing. Um, you do, uh, you know, if you've got good uh, leaf cover, um, then hopefully you're not having a lot of, um, moisture pulled out of the soil by the, by the sun. Um, so would you recommend that I, what I do is I, I pull up the leaves in places where I don't want leaves and I have one of those vacuum mulchers. Mm -hmm. So then I spread that around a little bit, but not a lot. So leaf mulch is good, I guess. Yeah. If your plants are doing well. You know, once again, I don't have a ton of experience with succulents, um, but um, you, that, that's why it's so important for all of us to observe, to go out and observe, try something and then observe and see how your plant responds. And, uh, you know, your plants will usually let you know pretty quickly if they're happy or not. Well, I guess they seem pretty happy. So, okay. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's good. Okay, thank you, Cynthia. Next, we've got Pam Larkin. Oh, you know, Pam, I think, I'm sorry, Pam, to interrupt you. I think we're having some problems with your video feed. So maybe if you could, I, I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, Pam. If you could maybe enter your question, if you could maybe enter your question in, uh, in chat, we'll, we'll address it that way. So sorry, Pam. Okay, so. Um, goodness, sorry about that. Um, yes, Pam, sorry, if you could maybe enter the question in chat, we'll, we'll absolutely ask that. Um, you know, Barbara had a question here about avocado trees, Terry. Um, do I leave avocado leaves to mulch or rake them up? And what about the blooms? You know, I, um, I leave everything on the ground to mulch. Um, that's what I do. 
you know, I know that there are different opinions on that and that um, if there's uh, any sort of uh, fungal disease on the leaves, and that's probably not such a great idea, but um, in our garden, everything on the ground stays on the ground and breaks down naturally, including the blossoms, everything. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, next, I guess, Peggy, you have a question. Hi, yes. Thank you, Terry. Do you have any resources or articles on tillage or, you know, how, uh, you know, against the tillage practices? It seems like a lot of my friends um, and family, they're still stuck in the mode of, well, I'm going to get out there in the soil and I'm going to turn it over and, and uh, revitalize it. And you know, I try to educate them on that, but it would be helpful to have some material to give to them to read. Yeah, why don't I, I don't, I'm not sure that I have anything in the resources uh, for this talk, but I will, I do have some and I will, I will get them to you. And there's, there's a lot of interesting info out there now on tillage and the damage it's doing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question is from Erica. Uh, what is green waste made up of? And is this viable for all the dairy waste in Marin? Green waste, is, this actually happens to be um, the waste that goes, I believe that this is recology compost. And so it's what's picked up in people's green bins. So it's just what comes out of people's uh, gardens. Uh, so that happens to be uh, what they're using, what they used on this site. As far as um, dairy manure goes, I'm, I'm really, you know, they may be using some composted dairy manure. I, but uh, to the best of my knowledge in this project, they're using a green waste, which is what we throw in our green bins and gets hauled away and composted. I don't think there's food waste in this. I think it's just green waste. Okay, I hope that answers everyone's questions. Uh, if anyone has anything additional. Oh, Pam is waving. Um, let's see if, uh, Pam, you want to try to unmute yourself? Oh. Can't hear you. Hmm. Well, Pam tries that. We do have a question from Eloise. Eloise, you want to unmute yourself? Yes. So I thought tillage re referred to using a rototiller, but from what I'm hearing, it just means even disturbing the soil with a shovel. Terry? Yeah. If you continuously dis disturb the soil, I mean, if every spring you go out there and turn the soil over, uh, it really is no longer a good practice <laughs> to do that. You are doing some damage. You're better off, um, uh, you know, maybe having, if, if this is in a vegetable bed, you're better off having a cover crop um, during the winter. And then, um, yeah, it, when you turn that soil and especially repeated tilling, turning of the soil, you are damaging and breaking up that soil structure. So what is, has been, so, you know, for a number of years, I've forgotten the fellow's name up in the North Bay, who's oh, really big on double digging. John Jevons. John Jevons. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. So. I think he's getting away from that. Okay. Thank you. He, I think what, I think, I think his, you know, if you do a one-time turning of the soil, that if you have compacted soil and a one-time turning of the soil, that, that can, um, can be uh, beneficial, but if you're doing it uh, repeatedly and season after season, that is not. And I think that is what he's come to see now is that um, doing it one time to break up that compaction and then using cover crops. I think he's 
majorly into cover crops and always having a living plant root in that soil. Mm -hmm. I, I actually have another question for you. Um, what, what, and this has to do with cover crop versus mulch on soil. Um, uh, protecting the life in this is it a, what about putting like several inches of mulch onto soil that I'm you know that I want to leave bare and how does that affect you know the soil life in the soil with having mulch and not a living cover, cover crop the mulch is going to protect the soil from the sun the wind the rain so I'll help protect it from compaction it will provide uh, some food to the soil microorganisms, so they will be decomposing and breaking that down. A living root, I think, though, is going to have uh, far more benefit. But sometimes you can't always do that, and so uh, a mulch is is uh, is 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 important to do rather than leave your soil bare. Leaving your soil bare very quickly uh, leads to compaction. Thanks. Okay, Terry, we can go back to Pam's question. Uh -huh. uh, with increased threat of wildfires, mm -hmm. there is greater interest in fuel reduction where vegetation is removed um, and then burned and prescribed burns. Is this releasing large amounts of carbon into the atmosphere? Would it be better to compost this vegetation on a large scale? And do you have any thoughts of where to compost large amounts of organic matter, which in turn could then um, be used to compost pasture land? That is a great question. I, I had a feeling it might come up and it's a big question. Um, you know, my husband and I live in Loma Mar, so we had to evacuate for the fire. It was very quite close to us. So um, so what happens, um, uh, clearing the land, I have such mixed feelings over this, uh, removing brush is probably an important thing to do. Having an intact, more native community growing is, is, uh, I think a good thing because it's going to ensure that, um, that you've got good water infiltration when we have rain. Um, but out where we live, there's a, there's a lot of brush that is not native and that like blackberry that, uh, that burns very, very well. So um, there's a few different ways. One is people around here are bringing in goats. That's very expensive, but that's one way to manage it. Um, the goats eat it up, leave behind their waste product, and, uh, and that's an effective way if you can afford it. Uh, doing controlled burn is uh, another way to manage it. I think it's difficult um, because things have so overgrown here that it's, I think it's difficult, a little scary to control. I know that there have been some controlled burns um, in San Mateo County and in Santa Cruz County. Um, I don't know how large an area they've done. Uh, when you do have a burn, you are releasing uh, all kinds of things into the atmosphere, uh, carbon and all kinds of things. And um, uh, what I noticed after the fire, uh, the cruise fire, is that I don't know if this is related or not, but what I have noticed, and I've been meaning to ask Igor about this, is the oak trees look fabulous this year. You know, we had a very little amount of rain. The oak trees look absolutely fabulous. They're putting out a great amount of growth. The color in them is beautiful. And I'm wondering if all this ash uh, settled on their leaves, did some foliar feeding. I'm, I'm wondering about that. Um, as far as in our area, we are having, uh, the county is uh, actually has a chipping service so people can clear their land and, um, and they will chip and then, uh, and then they're recommending that we're mulching. However, all mulch will burn. And I witnessed this uh, in Lomamar walking on War Road. I saw that the fire came through the redwood trees there. The redwood trees happened to be fine but it burned all the mulch on the ground and uh, it just became carbon. You could see the needles and the shape of the needle. And as soon as you touch them, they turned to powder. They were actually ash. 
So it's it's complicated. Um, hauling it all away to a green waste facility is that's expensive. Um, you know, what we're doing here is uh, on our land, we have about 40 acres and uh, we, we, we cleared uh, some of the brush and we chipped it and we're gonna, we're gonna spread it as mulch because we figure that mulch is gonna be really important for feeding the microbial community and for ensuring good water infiltration when, and it, when we do get rain, hopefully a lot next winter. So it's a big, complicated subject, and um, that's my understanding of it so so far. And I'm not sure if I answered your full question. Did I, Kelly? <laughs> I guess um, I hope so, Pam. Yeah. If you have additional questions, <laughs> just uh, let us know. I guess we can move on to Kathy Trafton's question. She's got her hand raised. Okay, Terry, wonderful presentation. I appreciate that. Um, I have just sort of a nitty gritty sort of practical question. I did some sheet mulching. I've done used compost and now I have arborist chips. So, you know, and now like you know, I've put so much, you know, matter there often my soil is a little higher than my walkways. But more importantly, how do I um, add more compost? Do I just put it on top of the arborist chips or how do I add that little extra quarter of an inch, you know, how, how do I handle that? I don't want to shovel away all my sheet, all my chips. I mean, obviously. So what, what do I do? I don't, why would you even need to, why do you think you need more compost? Um, do you think you really need it? Well, it's probably a good idea. I'm trying to keep my occasional gardeners from clomping and walking on it. So it seems like more compacted and I'm trying to educate, you know, it, it's a, you know, it's complex. It's, it <laughs> is. They want to blow things and all of a sudden I see exposed soil and the mulch, you know, packed up against the wall. It's, it's an education thing, but I just feel like I need to mulch and sheet and compost. So. <laughs> yeah. Once, once you've sheet mulched and you put your compost and maybe your cardboard and your compost and your mulch on top, um, you generally don't need to maybe add more compost. If you, the most important thing for, um, for preventing compaction is to have, you know, if, you, if this is an area where people are walking, uh, just make sure you have a good thick layer of mulch, like three inches or so, so you could replace your mulch. If you're going to be planting in that area, you could add a little bit of uh, compost, depending upon the plant, around, um, around the top of the soil and then mulch on top of that. But um, if you have, like, uh, for instance, us, we have, um, we're moving to cover crops under our fruit trees, but we do have mulch under our fruit trees. And sometimes I take compost up there and I sprinkle it on top of the mulch and I just, just, uh, just water it in and, and the, the compost will move in, in the under, the oil, under the mulch. That makes sense. I'll call you back. I'm Thank you. Put a few extra Bob, stepping I'm stones in so people don't back. walk where I'm trying to keep them from walking. Yeah, great answer. Thank you. Okay, um, there's a question from Betsy. There was a comment that tillage activates decomposers too much. Uh, why was that bad? I know. Isn't that interesting that when you till the soil, you you are uh, disturbing the community. And actually the soil, it does not have as much oxygen in it as the atmosphere does. A well-structured soil is gonna have a lot of carbon dioxide in it as well. So when you till, you're introducing a lot of oxygen. And what you're doing is you're waking up those decomposer bacteria, the bacteria that are breaking down in uh, compo ma green material in our compost pile. They're very aerobic. They work very fast and um, they break all those carbon glues that the microbes have used to, um, to bond uh, the sand, silt, clay and organic matter together. So they break down the carbon glues, they break down the, the organic matter, it's all food to them. And you end up having less organic matter in your soil if you till. Okay. 
we have a, a question from Anne. Does rain now contain plastic particles? I guess she had read an article recently that it may be happening. You know, I wonder about that too. All those little nanoparticles out there, I wouldn't be surprised. You know, they're all out. I can imagine them floating, but I don't know the answer, Anne, but I can imagine that I think we're, plastic is everywhere. Yeah, but I don't actually know. Okay, we are coming up on, I think, the end of our time. Um, Janice had a comment about, I think, succulents and mulching. Oh, so uh, maybe Janice, if you want to yes. unmute yourself and, and explain that, that might be a nice, um, some nice detail to add to what we've been talking about. Well, um, I, I know that Cynthia asked that question about mulching, and, and I don't. I, I realize there could be an issue with rotting them if you add too much mulch. So I'm very careful about the quantity I apply, but I tend to use a mixture of horse manure mixed with shavings, which comes from horse stalls, is well aged so that it doesn't contain the pathogenic bacteria. And my succulents seem to thrive with that as long as I don't overdo it, you know, and make it too thick. Um, and that's, that's just what I wanted to add to that about the succulent um, mulching issue. And I don't prefer rocks over this much. I prefer my compost mixed with a little bit of um, shavings versus rocks. I know a lot of people like to mulch with rocks, but in my opinion, it just it makes a mess later on. And is it really serving, is it feeding the soil life? It's not. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they may get some additional minerals from it, but I think the rocks in the soil, they would actually reap more minerals from the rocks in the soil versus on top of the soil. And I don't think you find too many succulents growing in nature with a rock mulch. That's just my two cents. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What does Terry think about that? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know about the horse manure, but I, I tend to agree with you. You notice I didn't say rocks because, um, because, <laughs> um, yeah. And, and the, I, 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 that sounds good, Janice. You're, you're, you're far more expert at succulents than I am. Um, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't be afraid of putting a, a little bit of mulch on um, as long as it's kept away from the base, well away from the base of the plant, just to help prevent the sun from pulling the moisture out of the soil. And I think your amendment mix it, at Lingso actually is a good blend of like wood fines and compost. And yeah. I've used that as well, but it's not as handy to me out here in the coast. But <laughs> I think you. your, your amendment mix is, is great, I think. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> We've got um, another hand and a couple other questions. Uh, Kathy and, and Cynthia, would it be okay for us to take a couple more? Okay, I'm gonna go for it then. Yes. Um, this is a follow on from Pam. Um, she asks, what about weeds and non-natives moving into the prescribed burn areas? Um, is it okay to just let whatever grow, grow? Um, and even if it's large scale, like a whole forest, I hope I asked that correctly. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a good question. I know in, uh, we've been watching what's come back in, uh, in Lom off of Weir Road and it's the natives that are coming back, um, in this particular case. Um, and, you know, what, it's all a matter of practicality and, um, and having anything on the soil with a root is better than leaving the soil bare. And it's amazing how much of a seed bank we have in our soil and how much of that seed bank is, is old and able to germinate. So in some cases, I think we might be surprised at what comes back um, after a fire. And it really, you know, once again, it's observation, observation. 
But what you don't want to have happen is have that soil stay bare after a fire event and then a big rainstorm and wash all that soil away. You, you definitely don't want that. So you want to get some sort of, you want some plant life back there as soon as possible. Okay, we've got two more, Dave and Carol. So Dave, do you want to unmute yourself? Hello. Hey, Dave. Very nice to see you. <laughs> Um, one thing about succulents, I was thinking, and I haven't proven this, but succulents mostly grow in rocky areas. And so that's why I was thinking that more minerals would be wanting to give to succulents and using rocks or small pebbles as a mulch would work good for succulents. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not up for putting down, uh, uh, a weed block and then putting rock on top of it, but I see some people do that and it tends to work for them. So oh, really? mm. some, sometimes, you know, mm. it works. Mm. Uh, one of the other things I wanted to talk about was, was tilling. I don't like to till either, but sometimes it, uh, it comes time for someone to want to put a lawn in and we have to grade the area too. Mm -hmm. So would yeah. you recommend just tilling a, a less, not tilling so deep. And then also I'm always adding uh, compost. So I'm adding more of that biology into the soil when I do plant. So what, what would you recommend? I know. Yeah, you're right. I mean, sometimes you have to, you know, in a landscape, you've got to grade the land. And uh, sometimes you do have to go in and, and do a one-time till. And um, I think what, what, Primarily what I'm talking about here with tilling is ongoing tilling all the time, you know, every season tilling. That is not good. You do a one-time till, or even if you have a really heavily compacted soil, um, maybe a one-time till and add in a little bit of compost, that there's going to be some benefit to that. And then they get your plants in and your turf in. Yeah. Or, or maybe follow it with a cover crop before you put a lawn in. That sure, <laughs> you can do that. Yeah, then you build the soil up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Terry. Great, thanks, Dave. Um, and so for the last question from Carol, um, Terry, please address how to keep our veggie bent blend planter box fill vibrant. The uh, the many veggie questions on that. Many questions on the veggie blend and keeping it vibrant. Yeah. Um, cover crops would be one thing to do. Um, you are going to have in any sort of import soil, there's usually a lot of organic matter in there that is going to subside as that, as that organic matter gets digested. So uh, you need to add a little more compost to it. Um, and um, I really recommend a living root as long as possible. Thank you. <laughs> and if you have more questions on that, just, just send me an email and we can, you know, if there's a lot of questions on that, let's talk about it. I wonder, do you know how much clay is in the veggie blend percentage wise? It is, um, it is a, uh, it, okay. Do you guys want to hear about soil? Soil is really, um, it's a precious commodity now yeah. and it's very difficult to find uh, a clean soil. You can, you can someone, uh, you can purchase a sort of recycled soil but you can't be sure what's in it. And the testing mm -hmm. is, um, is difficult and, um, and not 100%. Uh, so we have made the decision to buy a soil that comes out of, um, uh, that comes out of, the, uh, out of a hillside that has never had any, um, any uh, farming done on it. 
So it's, so it's pretty clean. Sometimes it comes in as a sandy loam. Sometimes it comes in as a clay loam. So it is, it can have a clay content to it. This is not a bad thing. No, you need right. to build, yeah, yeah. But you do need to build that soil structure in it. You do need to take care of it. Um, that uh, in the veggie blend, I'm pretty sure that it is about 33% topsoil. And then it's, uh, the rest is organic matter, the distal compost and, um, and a redwood shaving. So it's a pretty high organic content to it. So over time, it is going to um, subside in your bed because that organic matter is being digested. So you do have to add organic matter probably um, every year to it. Um, and you do, and you really do, it would really be beneficial if you could keep a cover crop going on it all year long. When it's not when it's not growing vegetables, keep it growing with um, with some sort of plant. And I notice on the website you talk about um, two specific fertilizers. I can't remember the names of them, but prior to planting uh, a veggie blend bed, I've added those fertilizers. Those two fertilizers recommended on the website according mm -hmm. to directions. Mm -hmm in addition to compost? Mm -hmm. I don't think that you need to add um, the fertilizers when you first get the veggie blend. Uh, and these fertilizers, um, this is Can's Realm. Um, let's see, uh, she's probably recommending um, the down to earth. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, maybe the biofish or maybe the, um, I'm drawing a blank on the other name, but you can add that. What it's going to do is it's, it's adding food for the microbial community. Right. One of them has a mycorrhizal uh, fungi component to it. So if you're growing plants that aren't, you know, the brassica family doesn't particularly care about mycorrhizal fungi, but some of the other uh, veggies do really appreciate that fungal relationship. So on any of the down to earth's products where it says bio live on it, that means they've added in a, um, a uh, mycorrhizal fungi component to it. Thank you, that helps a lot, mm -hmm. Terry. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you everyone for your great questions. Thank you, Terry, for your very helpful answers. Uh -huh. I'm gonna hand, it, I'm gonna hand uh, the floor back to Cynthia. Okay, well, thanks everybody for attending. I think that that was so educational. The Q&A was just as educational as, as the whole presentation. So thank you for all your questions. Um, if you'd like to stay for maybe about 10 minutes um, just to visit, uh, we'll just uh, put our screen back to everybody again so you can see, oh, well, you won't be able to see everyone, but if you scroll through the screen, um, um, let's have, you can visit for a, about 10 minutes and then after that, we will um, have a debrief for all the people who have facil facilitated the meeting. Thank you.